Yeah, so I think we could go ahead with the discussion. And uh, so today's uh, agenda will be first, uh, there will be a speaker introduction, followed by which uh, there will be a discussion by Dr. Sharina Rice, and followed by which there will be a vote of thanks. So good evening, everybody uh, from India, and uh, good, good morning, uh, Dr. Sharina Rice, and uh, from wherever you are. Uh, good day, guys. Uh, so this is Danushya and the chapter lead and also a marketing and communications lead of Neurotech X India. So uh, today we have with us uh, Dr. Uh, Sharina Host, uh, sorry, uh, Sharina Rice. So Sharina Rice is a systems neuroscientist. Her neuroscience um, research has spanned from the level of molecules up to the level of awake behavior, uh, behaving animals with the most focus on brain rhythms and neural circuits and navigation. The discussion will be centered around neurophysiology and how principle, I mean, uh, how principles translate to neurotechnology with a focus on neuromodulation. NTX India is very happy to host you, uh, Dr. Sharina Rice. Uh, yeah, uh, so it's over to you. You can go ahead with the discussion. Thank you so much. I am excited to talk about going from neurophysiology to neurotechnology and how these the crossover happens. And the way that I think about this is, this is the distinction between technology and science, where technology is the practice and science is the principles. Science underpins technology is, science can inform the creation of technology is. So let's start with the principles first. All right, an intro to neurophysiology. What is neurophysiology? Usually people think of brains, but wait, there is more. The nervous system allows us to perceive the world. It's also the eyes, the ears, the muscles, the spinal cord. Thus, there is more than just a brain here. For the purposes of this talk, I will mostly discuss measuring and controlling brain rhythms. And this can be done non-invasively at home, measuring brain signals with an EEG. I've tinkered with this quite a bit oh, myself. So <laughs> Can you hear this? Uh, yeah, Dr. Sherino. Yeah, it's all perfect here. Yeah. Okay, good. All right, EEGs allow us to look at brain waves as broad brush strokes, but let's do a deeper dive into how brain waves are made in the first place. This is a picture of a mouse brain slice with fluorescent labels. Is this showing up? Your screen, your is, screen is perfectly clear, uh, Sharina. All right. Are you seeing a, a picture of a brain slice? Yeah, we are able to see. Okay, that is good. All right, with some fluorescent labels. So then if you measure electricity from a neuron, then you will find something like this. There is an action potential. And brain rhythms, they are produced through synchrony of action potentials and synaptic activity ensembles of neurons firing at the same time. And if we put a probe into the brain to measure these brain signals, then we will see that the synchrony of action potentials and synaptic activity generates oscillations. These are otherwise known as brain waves. If the wire or probe site is close enough to a neuron, we may see that neurons spike on the oscillation. And there are different ways to characterize brain waves. Note that higher frequency gamma waves tend to have lower power and lower frequency than delta waves. And we can think about this as if there was a big crowd in a stadium. If a microphone was placed in a random spot in the stadium, then we might be able to hear what is happening near that microphone. For example, how fast a person is clapping near it. But also 
when it comes to how people are clapping in sync with each other, we can generally get, okay, if everyone is clapping at random times, then we'll hear a high frequency, but it would be a relatively low power. But if everyone was clapping at the same time, at the same speed, then it would be louder, but at the same time, it would be more powerful. Brain rhythms are known to coordinate or synchronize neurons in time to coherently communicate with other regions. But neural interfaces treated as a pure black box analytics problem cannot solve everything. As the reason why they may fall short is because we don't just want to read out what is happening in the brain. It would be great to also be able to control neurons to solve problems such as problems in pain, sleep, and memory. Knowing how neurons work, how circuits work, and knowing how to have this read and or changed by a machine, that is how to go from neurophysiology to neurotechnology. What techniques are used to change neurons? There are quite a few. There is electrical stimulation, magnetic stimulation, targeted ultrasound, chemogenetics, optogenetics, environmental stimulation, behavior. I will focus on these three for this talk. The nervous system uses electricity, so it shouldn't be too shocking that adding electricity can change nervous system function. Let's look into tinnitus. Some people, they refer to it as tinnitus and neurophysiology principles that are leveraged to treat it. Here is a simplified diagram of the circuit in a brain region called the dorsal cochlear nucleus. And the dorsal cochlear nucleus allows suppression for self-induced sounds so that you are not deafened by the sound of your own voice when you speak. If your voice was played at the same volume at the same distance from your ears without you actually speaking, then it would sound super loud to you. And in this circuit, we have parallel fibers on the top and we have cartwheel cells and fusiform cells that synapse onto the parallel fibers. One way to see the difference between fusiform cells and cartwheel cells is by their spiking activity. Cartwheel cells have irregular complex spiking patterns, whereas in contrast, fusiform cells have regular simple spiking patterns. Cartwheel cells and fusiform cells have these apical dendrites that synapse onto the parallel fibers. And fusiform cells, they also have basal dendrites. If we stimulate the parallel fibers by injecting a current, that is similar to having stimulation from the somatosensory and auditory systems, the sense of touch and the sense of hearing. And this stimulates the apical dendrites of the cartwheel and fusiform cells. If we record from a fusiform cell, then we'll get an excitatory presynaptic potential, otherwise known as an EPSP. And then if we stimulate the basal dendrites, that's kind of like having these fusiform cells being stimulated by the auditory nerve. That would evoke a spike. Apical dendrites are plastic, whereas basal ones are not. So they change with repeated stimulation. And then if we stimulate the apical dendrites and record from a cartwheel cell, then that would evoke an excitatory presynaptic potential from the cartwheel cell. Whereas if we stimulate the cartwheel cell body with a current pulse, then that would induce spikes from cartwheel cells. Cartwheel cells, they exhibit these complex spiking patterns, but they're also able to exhibit simple spikes. And if all of these are stimulated at once, then this is what happens with the activities of these neurons. But the real point that I'm getting at here is that neurons, they don't just stay the same, even if they're the same neuron in the same circuit, but their activity changes based on how they're stimulated. And plasticity happens too, where neuronal activity changes over repeated stimulations. If these signals are maligned in time by overexposure to loud noise, then this can lead to the development of tinnitus, the phantom perception of ringing in the ears. This is a fairly common problem. 
but how do the electrical signals become realigned in time if they've become malaligned in time? Fortunately, there are non-invasive ways to do this. This is a treatment developed by Susan Shore Labs at, at Shore's lab at the University of Michigan. 15 minutes a day of this treatment eases tinnitus symptoms, where there are precisely timed sounds and there are weak electrical pulses that are synced together in time, just so. Susan was on my thesis committee, and what is special about her career is that she researched the physiological mechanisms first and eventually brought them to clinical trials. Similarly, there is a system that was developed by Hubert Lim's lab around the same time where there is a tongue array that gives electrical stimulation timed with hearing. How else is electrical stimulation used? People with Parkinson's disease have tremors, and this is partly because many dopaminergic neurons have died off. Electrical stimulation in the subthalamic nucleus can solve this problem. And deep brain stimulation, it's very invasive. It requires surgery. Not everyone is a great candidate for it, but it is a game changer for a lot of people. After a patient goes home from surgery, then the dose of electrical stimulation to the subthalamic nucleus, it needs to be adjusted. I will note that although these are often marketed as if they're seamless or rather small for a patient, it may look like they have a box about the size of an iPhone embedded in their chest. And brain surgery itself can be quite terrifying, helping some motor systems without really helping others. So there is plenty of room for these kinds of technologies to improve over time. Electrical stimulation can help with some problems, but there is a big limit. The big limit is that these treatments, they, if they were well-targeted, and if they produced as many benefits as possible while minimizing risks, then that would that's what we want out of medicine. So for some problems in the brain, you need specificity, kind of like if you're playing the piano, you need to play the right notes at the right time in order for it to be a song that sounds good, that is played well and right. So then the field of neurotechnology has been limited by its tools. But what if there was a way to become more specific? What if people could target specific kinds of cells and choose to either activate or inhibit them? Not as a broad brush stroke, but as a very specific thing. What if the mechanism of disease really has to do with mutations in a particular neuron type, but not others? And what if the way to treat those is to specifically target those kinds of neurons to reduce potential side effects. Thus, we head into a brave new world, a world that uses synthetic biology to control neurons by getting the neurons to make ion channels that we are able to visualize and to control. I will talk about the genetic tools of optogenetics and chemogenetics. What both of these do is they have neurons expressing channels and ion channels, they can be activated. There are multiple different options of opsins, and they have different properties to them. Some of these are the channel rhodopsins, and they express cation channels. Cation channels, they allow positive ions to flow through when these channels are activated with light. So then, if a channel rhodopsin expressing cell is exposed to a blue light, then that would activate the neurons that these channel rhodopsins are expressed in. Archaeorhodopsins would have a chloride channel being expressed, and that would allow negative ions to flow through when they're activated by light. So then archaeorhodopsins would limit or uh, inhibit the neurons they are expressed in. 
You can target specific neuron types by targeting neurons in a region of interest with channel rhodopsins or archaeorhodopsins. So if you want to inhibit a circuit, you might do this specifically by either exciting inhibitory neurons or by inhibiting excitatory neurons. The thing is that these genetic techniques, they're not used yet in humans, but I think that knowing about these techniques allows us to understand neural circuit function better. And perhaps too, we can look at, into the neurophysiology to see around the corner for where the neurotechnology field is headed. The nice thing too about fluoresc about these genetic tools is that they can be used with fluorescent tags to see things that are super small at the level of cells and their axons and dendrites, things that diffusion tensor imaging and fMRI cannot get at and EEG definitely can't get at. How are optogenetics used? Well, I think that the general function of the nervous system is navigation through life. And we've used optogenetics in my dissertation lab as a grad student at, to focus on how the brain makes sense of spaces. Part of this was looking at which parts of the brain were talking to each other and what they were saying when they were talking to each other. One part of the brain that was very interesting to us in Omar Ahmed's lab was the retrosplenial cortex. And this is a brain region that has reciprocal connections with other areas. It's part of the larger memory circuit, integrating and processing sensory information. The retrosplenial cortex is shown in red here. It's called the retrosplenial cortex because it is located behind the splenium which is shown in orange. And it's thought that the retrosplenial cortex is the bridge between our perspective of ourselves and our perspective for environmental cues. Oh, my screen sharing has stopped. I'll reconnect this. I don't know. Sure All right, is this working? Uh, yeah, no, it's fine. Okay. Right now I'm wondering if anything was missed or mm. if there was some kind of lapse. Uh, no, till now it was fine. It was just, uh, at this slide it just came out, yeah. All right, that's yeah. good to know. Okay. It is thought that the retrosplenial cortex is the bridge between our perspective of ourselves and our perspective for environmental cues. And it's one of the first brain regions to undergo pathological changes in Alzheimer's disease. I've done hundreds of surgeries for circuit tracing experiments. Channel rhodopsin assisted circuit mapping is also known as Crackham. So when it comes to neural circuits jokes, Got to crack them all. I injected the anterior th thalamic nuclei with an EYFP tracer, so an enhanced yellow fluorescent protein tracer. And we found that that region projected over to these regions shown in green, these layers, particularly layer 1A and kind of in layers three and one B in the retrosplenial cortex. I've also done some tracing from the claustrum, which is a region that is involved in consciousness. So we can see where different brain regions project for that. And my colleagues, Isabella Jadrasiak cape and Ellen Brennan have performed channel rhodopsin assisted circuit mapping experiments on these brains. These different fluorophores allowed us to see where these projections went to and how. And 
also by using channel the channel rhodopsin assisted circuit mapping, we were able to look at how stimulating these different layers with light affected these two different kinds of neurons. A low Rio based neuron, which is thought to encode some head direction information, as well as regular spiking excitatory neurons, which probably encode different information from head direction information given the neurophysiological properties. So then we, all in all, we found that spatial inputs, they seem to be going to these layers of the low Rio base neurons, whereas non-spatial inputs that are from regions that are involved in encoding emotions and consciousness, they seem to be synapsing in parallel to the regular spiking neurons. So then maybe someday these kinds of principles of neural computation can be used for creating treatments that restore retrosplenial function or inform architectures of artificial intelligences. Here are some ideas for how to design a research experiment using optogenetics. You can inject a virus of interest into a region of interest and you can see where that virus expresses downstream as well by seeing, okay, if we inject the virus here, then where does the fluorophore tag appear in other regions? Also, we can see, okay, what are the effects of stimulating or inhibiting that region specifically as a whole? Because sometimes downstream processes, they also have a measurable effect versus the specific projections that go well, that are directly from the region of interest that we also want to look into for the circuit. And then we can measure using electrodes or pipettes downstream. Also, we can see what happens to the oscillations and to individual neurons with different frequencies of stimulation via lasers. So these lights, it's not, I, it's not that they absolutely have to be at one particular frequency of flashing, but they can be at very, very fast flashes, or they could be at slower flashes so that we can see what's happening with these neurons. Optogenetics technologies, they're still under development. They are still impending for use in humans. For further reading, I would suggest looking into the Boyden lab at MIT and the Dizeroff lab at Stanford, which has done a lot of work in developing optogenetic tools. There's also chemogenetics. Can these neurons be modified with chemicals? And the answer is yes. There are these things called designer receptors exclusively activated by designer drugs, otherwise known as DREDs. And similar to how optogenetics can be used to excite or inhibit neurons, chemogenetics can too. By this drug called clozapine and oxide, otherwise known as CNO. But really it's not CNO that creates the effect on the dreads. It's a metabolite of CNO that activates the dread. But CNO is usually administered into the body of an animal either by ingestion, by giving it an injection, or by giving them food or water that contains CNO. And then after CNO enters the body, then it's metabolized into a molecule that activates the dread. Chemogenetics has some advantages to optogenetics. For example, there's no laser logistics. It is kind of a pain to both implant lasers and also implant electrodes into a brain. And also, sometimes a brain can be literally fried with lasers if it's stimulated too much. And optical fibers, they, 
they take time to make as well in order to get all of the parts just right. Chemogenetics can also be administered chronically in water, which is useful. We can't really have optogenetics working all the time on an animal without some serious dangers. Some challenges of chemogenetics include things like guesswork. You don't really know for sure after you've administered clozapine and oxide whether or not they've become active after the injection, for sure. You can kind of get at this by looking into the literature. Metabolism for chemogenetics, it's been documented with different doses. And we could expect the effects to start about 15 minutes after an injection, but to taper off at, at about 40 minutes past an injection. But look into the literature for your specific use case to determine timing and dosages. And unlike with optogenetics, where the experimenter can control how fast the laser flashes to control the speed of activating ion channels, this can't be done with chemogenetics. Advances in chemogenetics would be new designer receptors and new designer drugs with efficacy. It's notable that making, characterizing, and expressing new molecules in chemogenetics is an amazing emerging field. And the Roth Lab at UNC Chapel Hill and the Sternson Lab at Genalia have done a lot of work in this. The tools inform the discovery. Discovery informs the tools. And these things create better closed loop neuromodulation systems. All right, it's time for a discussion. Uh, great. Uh, uh, guys, do you have any questions that you wish to ask uh, Dr. Sharina? Aditya, would you like to ask something? Uh, hello, am I audible? Yeah, you are. Yeah, I just had a okay. question like, yeah. So uh, you said like we can, the brain wave that we're recording currently, we get it as a sum of like uh, potentials of like a group of neurons, right? And maybe by inserting that uh, neuropipettes, we can get uh, individual neural activity. But uh, if we consider in non-invasive way, is there some way that we can get uh, individual neuron activity in a non-invasive manner? Well, that would be wonderful. But the thing is that it can't be done really yet. You can target, OK, you can target populations of neurons with things such as targeted ultrasound or by transcranial magnetic stimulation, but you cannot target individual neurons that way. At least not yet. It's too big. Aditya, your voice is breaking. <laughs> your voice is slightly pixelated. Try again. Aditya? I think we lost him. <laughs> yeah, there's oh, Harsh Oh, we Harura. have a hand up. Yeah. Hello, Harsh. Hi, Shari. Uh, thanks for the wonderful talk. So I had a question about uh, transcranial brain stimulation. So I just wanted to ask you, like, what is your view on it's a TACS or TDCS because I heard that these days um, these techniques are 
be utilized in, at the clinic, but at the same time, uh, no, the, the understanding we have is much less. I mean, as of now, and especially regarding the specificity. So as you said, we need a good knowledge about time and like where to stimulate and when to stimulate. So what is your view on that about the, about transcranial network? Oh, can you repeat the question? No, oh, is my voice fine? Uh, you are oh. audible, Harsh, yeah. Okay, so I wanted to ask about the transcranial brain stimulation, uh, the TACS or the TDCS. Okay, transcranial magnetic stimulation. Not it's magnetic, been shown. Electrical. Oh, electrical stimulation? Yeah, transcranial electrical stimulation. Well, electrical stimulation, it's uh, for, for the brain. It's been used for a lot of things. It's been used for the treatment of depression, and it's been shown to be quite effective in that. It's also helped with activating function of different brain areas with quite a bit of specificity to it, where they would target a specific area of the brain and see, OK, does this cause a finger to move, for instance? So. It's still an interesting area. There's the question of when is this going to come into more common use? Can, can everyone have their own brain machine interface device? Could people have these in their homes if they need the treatment? Or will it be confined to a clinic where you have to go in and have this as a special thing? Is this answering okay. your question? Yeah, yeah, thanks, thanks. Does anyone want to go ahead uh, with your questions? And it's okay if you ask crazy questions as well. Some of those are the most fun. Uh, so I had one uh, question. When you uh, spoke about um, the fusiform cells and the basiform cells, I just, uh, and you said about the stimulation of uh, axons produces one results and stimulation of dendrons produces others. So uh, how, how could we like uh, specifically target only the uh, particular area of uh, the nerve? Is it, is it possible? Like, uh... Actually, it kind of is if you know the physiology behind it. So, for example, if you want to target specifically the, the basal dendrites, then it does help to activate the auditory nerve somehow. And how do you activate the auditory nerve? Well, you can prevent someone with a sound stimulus, and that would activate the nerve in a non-invasive way. But also, there's the question of, OK, how about aligning that with with things such as the sense of touch, which allows us to suppress to suppress self-induced sounds. In that case, then it helps to activate the somatosensory nerve. And that can be done either by some sort of electrical stimulation or, or actually having the person say something at the same time as they're given the auditory stimulation so that it syncs up somehow. Or, it can be done by some other activation that would give a signal that corresponds in time to the degree that is needed. Might have to be tuned in some cases. Usually, at least for most people, it's well aligned in time just when they're, they're born pretty much. <laughs> Got it, uh, Dr. Sharina. I think Shruti has a question. Shruti, you can go ahead. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, I just wanted to ask about, you mentioned closed feedback loops. Uh, so I wanted to ask about uh, any examples that you've used. Like, have you used reinforcement learning 
to uh, like uh, oh, any examples of closed feedback loops in neuroscience in neuromodulation or something? <laughs> closed loop systems are very awesome. Okay, I guess that I should explain what closed loop is versus open loop. Think about a dryer, for instance. Okay, if you have a dryer that is turned on, then and it's going to continue drying clothes uh, just set to a specific time, then that's a rather open loop system because even if your clothes are kind of wet at the end, then it still stopped because it didn't measure anything from it. That is an open loop, but it would be a closed loop system if it continuously monitored how wet the clothes were and continued drying based on that. Similarly, with closed loop systems in neuromodulation, if there was a way to get at, okay, is this treatment actually having the effect that we want it to on this circuit? Is it actually activating the neurons that we want it to or suppressing the neurons that we don't want, uh, that we don't want to be activated? Is it having the effect that it needs to have? That is a fantastic problem. We were going to have a closed loop system in my thesis lab at one point where we would have a mouse on a spherical treadmill and the mouse, it advances through a virtual reality maze based on activity in its motor cortex. So it could just stand on the ball and if it could get its motor cortex to be active while it's just standing there, then it would advance through this maze. And that would be a closed loop system because the maze would advance based on the brain activity. And also the brain, it would probably receive updates from visual information coming in from this virtual maze. So that's one idea. Another example of closed loop systems that we may see on the news and things like that are things like systems that allow people to, to write information so for example, words through their thoughts by picking up neural recordings and then going, okay, this person is thinking of this word, so we're going to make this tweet based on it. That has been done as well in the world. Okay, thank you. So we have a question from Nishta Pange. Uh, Nishta, do you want to like unmute yourself and ask a question yourself uh, yeah sure um am i audible yeah you are yep yeah thanks for the great talk i just uh, wanted to ask a question about the retrosclenial cortex stimulation so my question, I don't know if it's, uh, it, it makes sense or not, but uh, is there a difference in the stimulation uh, that, like, with people who, can, who have the sense of vision than people who do not? Because is there a difference in the spatial inputs and how the retrosplenial cortex stimulates like, people who are blind and people who are not? Is there a difference in that? That is a great question that needs to be explored more, but how could we explore this? The answer is partly by, okay, well, we could be measuring the retrosplenial cortex of people who are blind, that's one way to do it, or by mice that are blind, that's another way to do it. Some mice, they would be genetically made so that they're just blind from the beginning. And the cool thing about how the brain makes sense of spaces is that if one set of inputs is not good or it's inaccurate, then there seems to be more neural computational weight that is put onto other parts of the brain that will allow them to successfully navigate. So for example, okay, if we're trying to get around a room but we are in the dark and our eyes are closed, we're still going to be able to get around and to navigate okay, especially if that became just our everyday life. And that's partly because we're counting the number of steps that we're taking to some extent. It's partly because we have some sort of memory of what happened. It's partly because the architecture of how our brains make sense of space are fairly similar 
even if it's not a complete visual deal. Uh, but uh, it can be, it will be different for people who are congenitally blind, right? It would probably have some differences, but at the same time, I, I can't say for sure because we haven't studied this. We would expect, uh, but the thing is that for people who are congenitally blind, then other regions take over the visual cortex in terms of their neural wiring, which is very cool. <laughs> but at the same time, this, this creates this question of, okay, what kinds of sensory substitutions are in place? Are they substituting a sense of sound, for instance, for a sense of vision? And what kinds of strategies is that individual using in order to make sense of their spaces? And different people, they may have different strategies. Some people may be discouraged from using clicks in order to kind of echolocate around, whereas other people, they would be strongly encouraged to do that because that's their best way of coping. Yeah, thank you so much. So I had a question. Uh, with respect to neurostimulation just starting out and everything, how is the field in the US and how do you think from the research to uh, the healthcare sector where it could be actually used to treat this depression or um, uh, Parkinson's or any neuro uh, degenerative diseases? Like uh, how many years do you think for would it take for the uh, neurostimulation of any kind to come to the like actual practice? I think that it depends on how invasive it is. And that is a huge hurdle. So then when it comes to things like internal review board guidelines and trying to get that paperwork approved, there is a bureaucracy. When it comes to getting the Federal Drug Administration approval, FDA approval, then that takes a while. So there's the question of how many people are needed for a clinical trial? What is the pipeline? How much risk is there involved? And if, if surgeries are not necessary, then that makes things faster. If it's low risk and high reward, then that makes things faster. If it's shown in a lot of people in the beginning that it works well, then that makes things faster. But if it's shown that it needs a lot of fine tuning and a lot of it needs to be done exactly this way and exactly this way and all of the steps needs to be done kind of like how if you're if you're trying to unlock a combination lock if you get two of the three numbers correct then you're not going to be able to unlock the lock but if you get three out of three correct then you are able to lock unlock the lock it's kind of similar to that where okay some treatments you might be able to get one number right and it's still going to create a good positive effect for a treatment outcome whereas others they will take tons of steps and they will take longer to get to market partly because people still have to figure that out so there are ethics guidelines in play in terms of is this actually good for a person has this been shown in an animal model first what kind <laughs> and is their nervous system actually similar to a human nervous system for this particular case because humans don't have whiskers and right. they have different methods of balance for instance Understood. lots of things are the same though yeah so we're very similar uh, many of them I know from here, India, like they, they want to explore neuro I mean, uh, neuro stimulation, but um, they're afraid because there is not, not much information on that. And uh, people are not aware of what it could help them become. And uh, also there are little uh, regulations uh, on the space. I think uh, as space grows, uh, this would be one uh, major breakthroughs in the healthcare industry. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, does anyone else have any questions? Oh, I have another comment. 
Yeah. It's interesting too that when it comes to technology in general, innovations, they tend to start in the gaming industry first of all things, partly because it's very low risk for video games to happen. So artificial intelligence, that first really arose in gaming. When it comes to augmented reality, extended reality, and these kinds of visual stimulations, they came from gaming first. And then eventually, it seems that the last technology that things go to is medical technology, partly because it is a highly regulated field and partly because of the rigor that is needed for testing. So one way to look at things is to go, okay, how can we connect the dots between things like games and things like the medical world, but make them faster? And that is a cool thing that's happening in the medical metaverse. <laughs> right. So, uh... Like, uh, could that gap be bridged by neurofeedback in the beginning and then followed by neurostimulation? Like, as, the, as I'm aware of many companies or, uh, and many research uh, in the area of neurofeedback that's been happening actively, uh, be it healthcare, be it uh, non-healthcare, even civilian applications. What is your comment on that? Yeah, I think that that has a lot of potential where EEG is they're becoming a lot more accessible by ordinary people over time, which is great <laughs> because it used to be that a person would need to learn how to use wet electrodes and to get the contact sites to be good. And then they would have to learn how to read neural signals, which is, well, they can learn to do that. It's just that it's, it's something that a lot of people, even who have studied things like physical therapy, it's not an obvious thing to them. So I think that the first way that this seems to be done is, okay, can we use brain waves to choose particular music that is going to help people to go into a state of focus? Because that's super low risk it's very rewarding to help people maintain focus. And there are companies like Neurable, Neurosity, and various others that are doing that. As for treatments of things like PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder, that is being explored by the military. And there are more and more over time for methods of training, for learning and memory, as well as the use of games and EEG. Right. Yeah. So uh, when you said about PTSD, would it, would it not come under the hood of the healthcare uh, industry or psychological industry where it would require more regulations and also um, like a protocol and FDA approval and everything in hand to just get into the market? It depends on whether this is called a healthcare technology or a wellness technology. So if it is said that, okay, this thing treats this condition and we show this as our claims of efficacy, okay, this percentage of people experience this percentage of reduction in symptoms, then yeah, that does require a lot of testing. But if it's more of a wellness product of, okay, we have this device and it helps to relieve stress and this is for general wellness, then that can come to the market a lot faster than if it was marketed as a medical device. Got it. But uh, for a wellness device to be trusted by people, uh, it should be backed up by a research, right? Like, uh, research studies and publications and everything in hand for people to trust it and know how uh, efficient this is. Yeah, there's the question of exactly how are these things marketed and how, how efficient are they? So for example, okay, I could say that I'm going to meditate because I've heard, I've just heard from, from my priest of my temple that it's a good thing to do to relieve stress. <laughs> the thing is that 
the evidence in scientific literature, it's somewhat mixed, partly because the different me meditations and how people actually report on how they meditated, it may be correct or incorrect. So it seems that the mounting evidence is that if it's done well and it's true meditation, that it's going to help in a lot of problems in life. <laughs> but there are so many things in the craziness of the human condition and the mess of it, <laughs> where just because a person says that they're doing something or it's shown that they're doing it behaviorally, there's the question of, okay, what is actually going on in their imagination? Are they saying something completely different in their head than we would hope or expect them to say? And can Very that actually true. be controlled? <laughs> true. True, Dr. Sherina. Yeah, I think I'm done with my questions. Uh, does anyone have any other uh, questions for doctor? Uh, so I think we could go ahead and uh, conclude the session. So uh, Aditya, like, is your connection back? Yeah. Can you just confirm if I'm audible clearly? Yeah, you are audible. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Aditya, you? Yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Sherin, for joining in uh, for the session. And it was a great session for all of us uh, where we got an overview of how we go from neurophysiology uh, to neurotechnology. So I thank you on behalf of NTX, NTX India and I thank everyone to join in for the session and uh, we'll be having the next uh, discussion forum uh, in the coming weeks. So do join in for them also and thank you Dr. Sherry for joining. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you uh, Dr. Sharina. So this uh, a final message. Uh, so in case if you're uh, willing to join the community of Neurotech X and uh, want to join in our other further events as well, you could uh, use the link in the chat box and uh, join the session. Uh, so we had a fruitful session today. Thank you, Dr. Sharina. And this session is uh, uh, going on YouTube uh, next week. Uh, so in case if you've missed it or if, uh, some friends uh, who have were not able to make it today, can you share it with them? Okay. Thank you. What do I do if I think that there was one mistake in this talk? Uh, like mistake as in... Uh, where, where as, in uh, as in one investigator whom I've mentioned was not the correct one who studies chemogenetics at Genelia. Okay. So maybe uh, we could uh, change it in the description. Uh, you could send, send us over the content on where it has gone wrong. We could change it in the description. All right. And then there's also the question of all of the noise in the background. They were, uh, <laughs> it was particularly perfect. So you don't have to worry about that. Okay. That's good. Yeah. We had an amazing session, doctor. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. See you next week. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.